Today's lecture covers consciousness and sleep. And the first thing we need to talk about when we talk about consciousness is what it can do for us. So consciousness, if you'll remember from your terms and your reading, is basically our state of awareness of ourselves and of the stimuli in our environment around us. It's the part of you that you refer to when you say I or me. Um, so consciousness serves three functions. This is why we have it. First is to restrict our attention. Your consciousness decides what you're going to pay attention to and when and how much attention you're going to give it. The second thing it does is select and store meaningful information. What this means is that consciousness decides what of what you experience or observe to keep and what to sort of delete or get rid of. And last, it helps you make decisions. Consciousness lets you consider what's happened to you in the past and it lets, lets you consider what the future consequences of your actions might be based on your memories and prior experience and make a choice based on those things. So these are the three basic functions of consciousness. Without consciousness, we would have a hard time doing these things. Um, I want you to consider for a few minutes while the lecture continues how these functions are used in everyday life. How are you using these three functions of consciousness even right now? Consciousness is divided up into three levels of conscious processing. Um, this is research that was done by Sigmund Freud, so this is the first of the Freudian ideas that we're going to cover, but essentially he divided your conscious awareness into three levels, the conscious, the subconscious, and the unconscious. Now consciousness is your direct sort of general awareness of yourselves and the world around you. Um, you should have a handout that has a picture of an iceberg with consciousness above the water and everything else underneath it. This is a useful metaphor for understanding how Freud thinks about consciousness. He thinks about it in three levels, and conscious is the only one that's above the water. Everything else is going on below the water or below the surface of your conscious awareness. The subconscious, sometimes referred to as the preconscious, is the level where you're not really consciously aware of things, but they're available for easy access. Think of it like backstage or the side wings that are next to the stage. So you're not directly on stage, you're not directly consciously aware of these things, but they are nearby, ready to come out on stage when you need them. Think about things like memories and moods. You're not consciously aware of every fact you've ever learned, but you can easily recall them if you need to. Or you could be in sort of a grouchy mood and it might cause you to snap at someone or be rude to someone in a line at a Burger King, but you're not gonna be consciously thinking about that mood all the time. And the last level is the unconscious. This is where everything automatic occurs. And this is also where things that you're never going to be consciously aware of will sort of lurk way down deep below the surface and sort of mess up things. Um, so it's things like automatic reactions, like reflexes or fight or flight responses. It's things like your cognitive processing, your problem solving abilities or your uh, encoding of things into memory, the general stuff that goes on in your brain that you're not really ever going to direct the behavior of that. Um, perception, when you're seeing an object and you see it as a circle or a square or a dark blue or light green, that stuff is going on in the unconscious. Your repressed memories, this is something we haven't talked about much yet, but Freud thinks that when you experience trauma, something bad happens to you, it's particularly traumatic or severe, especially when you're a kid, we tend to repress those memories or bury them in the unconscious and forget about them completely until the time comes when they affect our behavior or our thinking as adults. Um, your unconscious desires or fears fit into that realm also. Things that you're wanting or you're scared of that you don't even really know that you want or fear. Uh, your intuition, implicit knowledge, things that you just sort of have this eureka moment and think of something without really realizing it, and your habits. Um, lots of stuff hangs out in the unconscious, and Freud says that this is a major reason for the strange personality traits, behaviors, and defense mechanisms that we develop. So we're going to refer back to this model of understanding consciousness later when we talk more about Freud and his research. And on a more philosophical bent, the, uh, there's two different perspectives to understand consciousness and sort of where it resides, if you will. There's the physicalist view and the anti-physicalist view. The physicalist view states that your mind or your consciousness is solely made up of physical components and processes in your brain. Things like neurons, synapses, and neural connections. This is what makes up your brain and nothing else. So this is the idea that there is no mind outside of the body, that they're permanently fused, and you're never going to see a difference between the two of them. Um, there's no separation 
So a physicalist philosopher would think of the idea of body snatching or switching bodies that we see in sort of popular science fiction as impossible because the mind should be totally wholly united with the body. So your consciousness is only made up of your brain and your brain activity. The other perspective is called the anti-physicalist view. And this is the view that your consciousness has some extra quality. There's some extra physical or additional piece of your mind or your consciousness that's totally non-physical, that sort of resides in your mind or in your brain without being part of it. Um, this is the concept of having some sort of a soul or a self that's separate from your body. Um, there are several sort of philosophical or thought-based arguments for why the anti-physicalist view might be correct. Um, the One of them is that there is a difference between knowing something by reading about it in a book and knowing something by personally experiencing it. This is called the Mary's Room argument. And the concept here is that if we take a little girl named Mary and we raise her in a totally black and white room, she has books, she has food, she has everything she'll ever need, but there is no color in her personal experience at all. She could read books about color all day, but she would never have a personal understanding of color because she doesn't have that experience. And that difference to an anti-physicalist philosopher is the difference between knowledge or knowing something and experiencing something is the difference between mind and body. There's also the zombie argument or the concept that we can conceive of a being that has physical motion without a consciousness, right? Like zombies, they can run around and eat people's brains, but they don't have any consciousness or self of their own, that the argument here is the fact that we can conceive of that means that there must be some kind of truth to it. The next slide, I'm going to ask you to write a paragraph about what you think, whether you sort of believe more strongly or adhere more strongly in the physicalist view or the anti-physicalist view and why. For today's lesson, we're going to learn about altered states of consciousness. So this whole time we've talked about what consciousness is, what its components are, how sleep works, how dreaming works. These are all sort of phases or aspects of that same consciousness or its total lack. But what happens when you're conscious, but your consciousness is changed? So it's not like you're sleeping or you're passed out. It's that you're still awake, you're still aware of what's going on, but that awareness has been changed or made different somehow. That's what we're going to talk about today. Um, so this encompasses sort of natural or non-substance induced uh, altered states of consciousness as well as substance induced ones. Um, so make sure you write these things down. There's going to be an activity to follow this. The first altered state of consciousness we're going to talk about is hypnosis. I know that in your homework I had you do some reading and thinking about hypnosis, but um, hypnosis is kind of, I won't say controversial, but there are people who think it's real and that it's an actual altered state of consciousness that a person can be put into. And there are people who think it's sort of socially constructed or it's not an actual change in your consciousness. It's something that you're sort of convincing yourself to play along with because you think it's expected. Um, so it's an altered state of awareness of the world around you, a sort of trance-like state where you're very suggestible. So people can tell you to do things and you'll just do whatever they tell you to do. Um, it's sleep-like, but it's not sleeping because you are still conscious somewhat. It's just different. Um, and again, it's you're really suggestible. So people have different levels of hypnotizability, which means how susceptible you are or how sensitive you are to being hypnotized. Some people can be hypnotized really easily. Others can be super resistant to it or are totally unable to be hypnotized at all. And this is the factor that leads some psychologists to believe that hypnotism is... Um, is a state that we're sort of creating for ourselves because if a person has a really strong belief that hypnosis is real, they're probably going to be more hypnotizable than someone who is very skeptical. Um, I can't say for sure whether this stuff is real or not. You're going to have to make a decision for yourself, but I just think it's kind of interesting that there's such a controversy about it. Um, so there's kind of a question about where hypnotism comes from, um, but it is used therapeutically sometimes or for entertainment purposes. You've seen magicians or people on TV will hypnotize people for sort of entertainment value or comedic effect, but therapists will use it to help people with chronic pain, to help them to think of their pain in a different way or sort of separate their pain from their body so that they don't feel it as strongly. Or therapists will use it to try to access repressed memories. This is a very Freudian concept that there are memories in the unconscious that we can access if we can sort of sideline the conscious mind or change it, make it more susceptible to accessing the unconscious. Um, sometimes it's used for therapy for things like depression as well. Meditation is the next one. 
Um, meditation is a change in your state of awareness of the environment and of yourself. So you're not sleeping, but you're not really taking in as much information from the environment. It's sort of like willfully ignoring both internal and external stimuli to have kind of a space of freedom from thought. Meditation is used by a lot of cultures and religions as like a religious practice or a way to gain some kind of enlightenment or knowledge about the self. But you don't have to use meditation for a religious purpose. Lots of people use it to help them relax, gain a little more self-awareness, um, calm themselves down, reduce stress, things like that. So there are a lot of different methods that people use to meditate. Uh, if you've ever done yoga before, yoga was originally developed uh, in the religion of Hinduism as a meditation technique. So there's a lot of breath control things that you can do or holding specific body positions to take focus away from stimulation and from internal thoughts to focus solely on the pattern of your breathing or on the movements of your body. That's one method to meditate. Some people will um, take repetitive motions. Zen Buddhists will do things like uh, you, have you ever heard of a Zen garden where there's like sand that's raked into really intricate positions? This is a meditation technique, doing a really repetitive task over and over to where you sort of check out, if you will. And that checking out is really what meditation is. You're sort of losing track of what's going on around you in the immediate present. Um, or things like sitting quietly and trying to reduce the amount of thoughts that you're having or repeating a phrase over and over or thinking of a specific image. There are a lot of different ways meditation can be achieved. Um, but the benefit of it is that it helps you be more aware of your own thoughts and it can help reduce anxiety and stress. So it's a useful tool, even if you're not doing it for a religious or cultural purpose. Next are hallucinations. Um, I know when you hear the word hallucinations, people automatically jump to drugs, but there are lots of times when people will hallucinate without any drug involvement. Um, so I wanted to talk about it separately. A hallucination is anytime you have a strong or vivid perception without any external sensation to back it up. So that when you hallucinate, the perception areas in your brain, your parietal lobe, is activating as if you were seeing something or hearing something or smelling something in reality, but there's no reality source to cause that. So that's why hallucinations can be so vivid and why it can be difficult to tell them apart from reality, because to your brain, they're not different. It's just, what's the source? Is it purely internal or is it coming from something external? That's what makes it a hallucination. Um, an illusion is a distortion of reality where you see things differently than they ought to be because of things like tricks in how your retinas perceive light, like in the optical illusions we've seen. But hallucination is perception with no external sensation at all. Okay, sometimes hallucinations can be caused by sensory isolation. Your brain really likes to have things to do, uh, especially while you're awake. This is part of the reason why we dream. We talked about this before, is that your brain is trying to, or one of the theories on dreaming is that your brain is trying to create some stimulation for itself. Um, so if you experience sensory isolation, like you're in a silent, dark room for any decent length of time, like five minutes or longer, you will start to hallucinate, or people tend to start to hallucinate because your brain craves stimulation. And if you don't have any, you can create your brain, your mind makes its own. Um, so to speak. It can also be a response to grief or to social needs. Have you ever heard of little kids having imaginary friends? I had one when I was a little girl. Um, her name was Jackie, and she was my shadow and my reflection. But I used to play games with her and stuff because little kids need socialization. And since I was an only child, I didn't have any younger siblings yet. I do now. Um, but at the time, I didn't. And so that social need was being filled for me by an imaginary friend. This is a fairly common thing that occurs in childhood um, because of the social need creating this hallucination. Um, also, they can be caused by changes in your brain, like a really high fever or swelling in the brain. Like uh, you can get hit in the head and have fluid build up in your brain and press on your parietal lobe and create hallucinations. Seizures, sometimes people will experience hallucinations while having a seizure or immediately after a seizure. Migraine headaches can cause something called auras, which is like seeing bright lights or colors of light or visual hallucinations while having a really bad migraine, which a migraine is a specific kind of headache. Um, sometimes exhaustion, sleep deprivation can cause hallucinations or really strong extremes of emotion can cause them too. 